privatization, now we hear people talk about good and bad privatization. I hadn't heard about that earlier early on. Mexico, as a matter of fact, Chile did its privatization long before the period we're talking about. Mexico did uh, massive privatization just during the period when it was stagnating. Unless we're into these long and variable lags like Milton Friedman, I don't see that working. Instead, I'm going to think it's the banking system. Chile took over its banks. I wish the, in the United States we could have taken over our banks two years ago. Uh, it took over the, the banks, banks that uh, accounted for more than 50% of uh, deposits. And within two years, it had them all privatized again or out of business. Mexico kept, uh, kept the banks uh, nationalized during the uh, whole period of the 1990s. It set low deposit rates, and the loans were not made at any kind of market interest rate. They're usually negative real interest rates, either to the government or directed by the government to firms that the government fav uh, favored. That's, that's going to be my story. Studying the experience of Great Depressions teaches us, or at least taught me and Ed Prescott, that massive public interventions in the economy to main in, maintain employment investment during a financial crisis can, if they distort incentives enough, lead to a Great Depression. Everybody keeps saying, especially the journalists, and then some of my less informed economist friends, say, oh, the reason we have to just go crazy right now is because the current recession is by far the worst since the Great Depression. I don't think so. Let me look at uh, two standard measures. Here's GDP. GDP, I got to use quarterly data. I don't have monthly data. What's a little bit dangerous here, I'll come to employment. It's a little bit dangerous here is the recovery is a lot slower, maybe because of policies we've put in place. But certainly the economic downturn at the beginning was worse for the recession that started in the end of 1981. People talk especially about the labor market. Unemployment is still not got to over 11 percent, which it was for, for, for two months during the, uh, during the 1981, 82, 83 recession. So I don't know these people who are saying, yes, I can find indicators worse today than during the, this period. Yes, I can find indicators in the 1980s worse than in the current period. The two standard things that we usually talk about, and certainly popular press does, is GDP and unemployment. And I'd have to say that the 1907-2010 recession is not noticeably worse. And so to, to some extent, saying we're in uncharted territory, at least looking at U.S. data. The danger is the, re the recovery seems slower, and there's still a danger of where it could turn, it, turn into a double dip. Now let me think about the United States versus Spain. I just wanted to do a picture like this. Um, these numbers I got from Ine look awful smooth to me. It's the way they do the seasonals. It has to be different in the United States. But here's uh, just some quarterly data for the United States and uh, United States and Spain. And from this perspective, this is not the perspective, perspective of my friend Ernest, the construction contractor. It's not what I read in the Vanguardia. Spain doesn't look that bad, huh? Sure, the economic downturn is steeper, but Spain had more to fall. Spain had been in the midst of an economic boom before the current problem, which the United States had not. Looked at over the last five years, Spanish growth experience doesn't look that bad. The Germans and so forth, they're going to start coming back here and try to build summer houses and stuff. Where else are they going to go? OK, all that being said, recovery in the United States has already started. Let's hope we don't drop back down. Recovery in Spain doesn't seem to have started yet. OK, I read things by some economists. Oh, we got everything wrong. 
I'm not convinced about that. We did get something fundamental wrong, but everybody got it wrong. I wish I'd gotten it right. I always thought housing prices could go down. I didn't quite understand the risks involved. And if, if the systemic risk of a falling housing prices had been understood and priced correctly, and we as economists, uh, regulators, bankers, so forth, if we had understood this, that would have led to higher interest rates on lending for construction projects, mortgages, and the problem to, to some extent would have been self-correcting. The lack of understanding there on the part, parts of banks, regulators, bond agencies calls for reform and perhaps new regulations. But I'm not going to push that too hard. Mistakes like this happen. Bad things happen. I don't think we should be constantly over-regulating our economy just to prevent the previous crisis from occurring. The new price crisis will take a different form. Instead, we should take a broader point of view. So what did we do right? I'm going to be selective here. I bet you guys can think of other people who got things right. Everybody who I'm going to have being right here is from Minnesota. Sorry about that. OK, but going back to the end of the 1970s, and even recently, so John Carrick and Neil Wallace, and then more recently Gary Stern, the previous president of our Fed, and Roger Feldman, have written articles and books stressing that efficiently allocating risk, especially in the financial system, requires that insurance has to be accompanied by regulation. Any institution that's too big to fail needs to be regulated. And I'm not in favor of too much regulation. But if you're going to let institutions be too big to fail, you regulate them. Otherwise, if you don't regulate them, you, don't, you let them fail. Maybe you have a fast way, might require a change in the US Constitution, of coming in and have the governments take over the banks the way they did in Chile, or the way they did in Finland, Norway, and, uh, and, uh, and Sweden. Then, you'll notice that my interpretation of the Great Depression events we've looked at has a particularly uh, uh, non-Keynesian slant to it. Whatever interest you have, whatever views you have, I think we have to study crises. I don't think we should think that crises can't happen. There are some famous economists who quoted as saying, sorts of crises that we've seen in the in past are things of the past. They can't happen now just because the Fed works too well. Uh, OK, that was a mistake. But it's by studying crises and having debate by different people with different points of view that we can get things right in the future. I'm afraid that in both Spain and the United States, policymakers were running around like chickens with their heads cut off, just trying to do anything. Some of the things they did were good, especially providing liquidity to the banking system and so forth. Some things, let me just mention a US example. I love to mention it. Cash for clunkers was bad. That was where we let people just turn in old cars to the government who gave them money, and then the money they used to buy new cars. I know how to stimulate the US housing sector, destroy half the houses in the United States. Okay. Just to get people a bit worked up, I can't help this. So those who justify the sorts of Keynesian policies utilized by the Mexican government in the 1980s or the Japanese government in the 1990s, often quote Keynes's dictum from the tract on monetary reform. Long run is misleading guide to current affairs. In the long run, we're all dead. I think if we don't consider the consequences of policy for productivity, in the long run, we could all be in a Great Depression. Thank you.